New Year's Eve, we got a video from Elizabeth Warren, Senator from Massachusetts. The way I see it right now, Washington works great for giant drug companies, but just not for people who are trying to get a prescription filled. Washington works great for for-profit colleges and uh, student loan outfits, but not for young people who are getting crushed by student loan debt. And you could keep going through the list. And so she made it a point to say that she is in it to win it. She is looking at uh, she's establishing the committee. She is moving forward on a presidential run for 2020. President Donald Trump reacting in an interview on Fox. Well, I'm happy about it. I think she'll be wonderful. I hope she maybe gets the nomination. That would be a wonderful thing for me. Let's talk a little bit more about this with Bill Rosenberg. Dr. William Rosenberg is a professor of political science at Drexel University. He's the co-author of News Verdicts, the debates in presidential campaigns, among other things. He's tweeting at Dr. That is D.R.B. Rosenberg. Bill, Happy New Year. Welcome. Thanks for being here today. Happy New Year to you. All right. So we've got a lot of names that we're already seeing as possible. She is now, I guess, officially a presidential candidate for 2020. Our first debates are going to be in less than six months. But let's note there are some specific reasons why people say, I'm thinking about it, or I'll have an announcement shortly. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about that uh, and something you've sent us notes on, and you've looked through this very closely. What what do people need to know about what it means to be an official candidate for president? Well, I think uh, just as a uh, minor detail, Elizabeth Warren is not actually a candidate yet until she does two things. Um, one is she has to file two documents, one with the FEC, Federal Elections Commission, which is a statement of organization, which talks about her uh, creating a federal campaign committee. And the second is a statement of candidacy. When both of those are done, she's formally a candidate. I'm not sure from what I heard in the news that she actually has done both of those things yet, but she said that she has the intention to do that. Another piece that sometimes people miss is that um, sometimes candidates, potential candidates, don't actually file these papers. They start 527s, which are uh, political action committees to be able to raise money, uh, but they have the restrictions on the amount of money that people can give to a political candidate. And I guess the the third aspect is that we have to recognize is that people once they file these papers and once they announce, are still not actually on a ballot anywhere. They have to go to all 50 states, and they have to get their name put on the ballot, and that requires signatures and organization and staff to be able to accomplish. So it's kind of a very elaborate process. Right now what we're seeing is people stepping forward and doing winks and nods and uh, visits to various, particularly early primary states, to sort of give a sense that they're interested in running, they might be running, they want to act like they want to be lured to run. But most people um, have not yet formally moved themselves in the direction of actually being a candidate. And and in some ways that is always to your advantage, right? It's sort of like you can play the game and people will ask you about it, but it gives you, if nothing else, a platform. Because once you say, I'm definitely not running, they kind of ignore you unless you're making news in another way. Well, exactly. And I think that what happens is that the candidates, uh, of which there may be up to 20 of them right now on the Democratic side, um, are really testing the waters. They're going and they're quietly trying to see if there's any interest uh, among the voters, particularly in states like Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, but also among big money donors, among Uh, political operatives to see who will join their campaigns. And if they don't formally announce, they they, uh, don't face the embarrassment of getting no support. Uh, But not everyone is interested, for example, in getting no support. Um, I can think of uh, Lindsey Graham in the last presidential race on the Republican side, who never got above maybe 2 or 3%. Uh, but he was out there making his case, being a presidential candidate and arguing for his view of the future. You know, you also have um, Al Sharpton, uh, who ran uh, with no hope of winning, but was trying to engender a sort of uh, politic that he wanted to make sure was present in the campaign. Go back a few years ago, and, and I, I guess it's more than a few years ago, you have people like Jesse Jackson who ran, who never really got much support, but was able to change the dynamic of the election. 
Again, uh, Dr. William Rosenberg, Bill Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University is with us. We've already looked at uh, a lot of the names, and I note that uh, you, you have some important dates for us to keep in mind. July 13th uh, is the beginning of the Democratic National Convention. That's 2020. The Iowa caucus is February 3rd of 2020. The first debates are going to happen in June. Tom Perez, who's the chair of the Democratic National Committee, said they're not going to do what the Republicans did, which is use polling to determine who gets on the stage. They'll do some sort of a random thing if they need to have two different debates, which raises a whole bunch of other issues. But before we get to that, let's note just where we stand right now, without necessarily picking favorites, is there a sense of what Democrats are looking for other than anybody who's not Donald Trump, which seems to be the qualifier so far? But uh, obviously, we've got everything from Joe Biden, who's 76, as you note, but he's pretty popular. Um, he's pretty liberal, but he's maybe not the future. He's the, he's the past. I mean, what is it Democrats you think are looking for? Well, I think the Democrats are in in quite a a difficult situation because they need to balance basically this current wave of activism, particularly on the liberal progressive side, with the more moderate uh, center of the Democratic Party and perhaps also the moderate center of the United States. There's been a lot of pressure to sort of move more and more to the left. If you've taken a look at the midterms and even before the people that are in the House, Uh, have become much more liberal than the Democrats have been in the past. The centrists have basically been tossed out. But what we have to recognize is if the Democrats are going to win, they can't just necessarily win with the liberal end of the political spectrum. That gives too much uh, yardage on the field to Republicans uh, who presently are not really fighting so much for the center, but could capture that. It's a concept called competition for the middle. If you move too far to one side, you lose more of the field, and, and that's not a good thing. So we have a lot of this energy that's out there, but you know, one of the telling signs for me that the Democrats basically are recognizing this is that if we've looked at the last um, couple of months, uh, the the politics behind Cortez, for example, from New York, and this push for really reacting negatively against um, uh, Nancy Pelosi. It looks like Pelosi's been able to close ranks in the Democratic Party and is going to become the Speaker of the House. It'll be interesting to see whether or not the presidential race will fare in the same way that some of the candidates that have less degree of electability but do represent significant portions of the of the Democratic Party are going to be able to coalesce around a winner and consider the most important thing getting a Democrat winning rather than a progressive winning. Yeah, and this is uh, Nancy Pelosi, if nothing else, proof that there's a certain amount that goes along with being experienced in Washington, D.C. with the way it works, uh, able to maintain her leadership. I did want to ask this other question. We have at least four senators, Sherrod Brown, Cory Booker, uh, Kamala Harris, and Elizabeth Warren, who we mentioned uh, before. Also, a couple of other names, Jeff Merkley and Chris Murphy, uh, have been thrown in there. But but they these are people who have a very, very good chance of, of announcing or thinking about a, strongly a run for the presidency. What does it do to the to the politics of Washington, D.C., when you've got that many senators thinking about a presidential run and the votes that will be taken, whether or not they're going to be test votes by virtue of what comes out of the House? Um, just it, it, How does this play into governance? Well, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is, uh, and I think you're making a very important question here, is that... Um, the people that are United States senators are going to have to go on the record. Uh, They're going to have to take votes, for example, about the border wall. They're going to have to take votes on health care. They're going to have to take votes on uh, what's going on in Syria. And that's going to constrain them a little bit in the sense of taking positions and then not being able to waver too much on the uh, political battleground of the primaries. Other candidates who are not in that position have more flexibility. They can sort of skirt some issues. They can go and drive in their own lane and and sort of reach out to people. So, you know, there was a famous article a few years ago about why great men don't become president. And one of the features in that article, uh, which was sort of an academic article, was that the people that become president are often people that were vice president, but also people that were governors and senators. Not too often are they... um, individuals that are members of the House, 
and rarely are they actually businessmen. In fact, Donald Trump is really the first one. So part of that strategy is sort of where do they come from, what are their experiences, and what degree, I think, of flexibility, as you raised, on being able to make stands. So people that are mayors or people that are members of the the, the non uh, governmental structure, for example, people like Eric Holder, uh, he doesn't have to vote on anything. Uh, he doesn't have to take that type of stance. And if you notice, he's the one who's the former attorney general for Obama, but he's been involved in redistricting, which is a very important political issue, particularly for uh, progressives in the United States. But it doesn't sort of put you on the, the battle line of the, the border wall or Iran. So it's interesting how all this plays out. Yeah, then eventually you'd get to who he had his clients when he was an attorney, because between the time he worked for Bill Clinton and the time he worked for President Obama, he was a practicing attorney. And the, who were his clients? What kind of cases did he did he work on? Who did he represent? And those kinds of things wind up coming up that we don't hear a lot about right now. But if he becomes really serious, they kind of lay your life out, don't they? If you become a presidential candidate, absolutely. You know, you have to you have to understand that your whole life gets uh, splayed out on the table, and as a result. Um, there can be a lot of um, information that you had hoped would never surface, but in the uh, in the age of Trump, we're seeing that while it didn't come out as much during the campaign, with all these investigations that are going on, much more is being learned about President Trump and his past. And when people become presidential candidates uh, going forward uh, in this era of 24-hour news and social media, uh, there's going to be nothing that's going to be laid uh, aside, everything that's going to come out, because everyone's going to have an agenda, and they're going to want to get the, the dirt, essentially, on people that they want to, you know, submarine. All right. Race is on. Bill Rosenberg, thanks so much, as always. All right. Well, you have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Talk to you again soon. Dr. William Rosenberg, professor of political science at Drexel University, co-author of News Verdicts, The Debates and Presidential Campaigns, a little look at the groundwork that needs to be done by hopefuls for the 2020 presidential nomination. He's tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg at D-R-B Rosenberg, R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G.